So hello and welcome to another episode of Top 10s in a new format we're trying out where we take a question asked by you, a member of our audience, hand it off to one of our writers and then present the answer in our totally trademarked listicle style. And today we're answering the question of what's the deal with ghosts? And this question was answered by Ian Forty. Find a link to their other work below, but you know, let's get to it. So do you believe in ghosts? A majority of Americans do. In a survey of a thousand people, over 61% said they believed in some kind of spooky ghost phenomenon. Earlier polls suggested that far fewer did and the answer sat around 41%. Years before that, it was about 42%. So even at its lowest, that's still about 130 million people who believe in ghosts, which is a whole lot of spooky happenings. The remarkable thing here is that we have no real physical evidence for the existence of ghosts and spirits and demons and all that nonsense, and we never have. However, it's a strongly held belief among many. Many people will even tell you that they have seen a ghost themselves. That's about 18% of the population of the United States, according to surveys like the one mentioned previously, so which works out to about 60 million people who believe they've seen a ghost with their own eyes, at least in America. Seeing isn't always believing, of course. Human eyes play tricks on them all the time with the help of a little imagination. Paradolia is the name for the phenomenon of seeing patterns in randomness. You know, think seeing a face in a coffee cup or an animal in a cloud. This is the same way it's believed that your mind can see a ghostly human visage in, you know, just a blob in the corner of your eye or creepy long fingers reaching through your window when it's just a tree branch lightly tapping against it, which is still spooky as all hell. Ghost stories, though, exist in pretty much every society that has ever existed in human history. We have all written and told stories about why spirits exist and can totally interact with us as far back as language goes as far as we know. For some people, this is enough proof. Why would we talk about ghosts and spirits and demons and spooky happenings if they weren't real? On the other hand, there's been stories about fairies, vampires and dragons that are just as old and fewer people tend to believe in them. So even though millions of people have claimed to see ghosts, research does tend to poke some holes into their stories. A pair of sociologists, for example, writing a book about hauntings and ghost sightings found that many of their participants admitted that they hadn't actually technically seen what they thought was a ghost. Instead, they'd experienced something that they simply couldn't explain and then chalk that up to a ghost when it could have just as easily been, you know, like a, a vampire or a dragon or alien. Now, researching ghosts is a fairly difficult thing to do from a scientific perspective, not only because it puts you into the same camp as those, like, ghost scientists, so many researchers don't want to admit that they're actually researching ghosts because it's probably not the best thing to establish credibility, even if you've got, like, no doctor right in front of your name. So, do ghosts have a physical form? How can they pass through walls if they do and appear and disappear at will, but then somehow also move objects and open and close doors at the exact moment you are just about to go to sleep? While all that is standard fare for a ghost, from a physics standpoint, it's very hard to reconcile. If ghosts are real, they're violating a lot of laws that kind of need to be true for our universe to not fall apart. Then you have the fact that some ghosts are reported to look human, but others are monstrous, skeletal, or entirely, decidedly inhuman. If a ghost is the soul of a person, how come some of them still have clothing? If a ghost is a being of pure energy, on the other hand, what's holding that energy together? What powers it? What keeps it going? Besides, you know, obviously the fact that it's just got some business unfinished here on Earth. Why are they not affected by gravity? These are many questions that get asked and there aren't many answers. Science has found no evidence that ghosts exist. So let's try and figure out what's going on, shall we? So the first thing we should establish is the psychology of believing. For all the questions you can ask about ghosts, and there's lots, science has few answers. And they're not the kind that most people who believe in ghosts are all that happy with, but they do kind of explain a lot of ghostly phenomena. Some people are just psychologically more inclined to believe in ghosts than others. Basic personality traits leave you far more willing to believe in ghosts and even convince yourself of the truth of certain unexplained phenomenon being rooted in the supernatural. If you're a generally more fearful, nervous, skittish person who believes in agency rather than chance has to be behind certain events or patterns, then you're more likely to believe in the supernatural. This tendency to believe in and see ghosts might even be 
evolutionary. It can help explain why some people never see a ghost and others will, because some people are simply more willing to believe a thing is a ghost, while others would see it as something more logical entirely. And there's a fun way to test this, and it's a simple thought experiment. Imagine right now you are home alone. Let's imagine now you hear a noise in your attic. Would you go up and investigate the origins and cause of that noise, or would fear keep you away? If you legitimately, honestly fear that there's something in the attic, even if it's something entirely rooted in reality, like a mugger or a rabid possum, you're probably also more likely to believe in ghosts. This is part of a survival instinct that literally dates back thousands upon thousands of years. If you're out in the wild and you hear a noise, that could be a predator. The smart move is to flee. Of course, there's a chance it could be the wind, but if it was a real threat and you chose not to run, you'd be dead. Fear is a survival tool. Likewise, experiments have established that some people are just kind of really open to the power of suggestion. This is how the human mind works, after all. For example, consider an experiment conducted in the 90s where two groups of people toured the same house. The tour was exactly the same, save for the fact that one tour group was told that the house was haunted. And would you believe that people on that tour group just so happened to feel uneasy and reported feeling an eerie sensation, intense emotions, and just generally like something else was going on, all because they were conditioned to expect it. The other control group, on the other hand, experienced no such phenomenon. Now, science is at its heart impartial, it's why it should be open to any phenomenon and then seek to explain it, including ghosts. So if 60 million people have claimed to have seen a ghost, it certainly gives rise to the need for some kind of explanation. But 60 million people seeing a ghost does not mean that ghosts exist. And I know what I saw. Other explanations could account for some of those phenomena, so let's take a look at some of the more popular ones, starting with the history of ghosts. And I don't like the pictures. I don't like the pictures that Ian Forty has put as the header. I, I don't need the, the spooky energy. <coughs> so part of the reason that the belief in ghosts among people is so pervasive is because ghosts are sort of pervasive throughout all culture. This is by no means a new idea. The Mesopotamians believed in ghosts four to five thousand years ago. They used to think that diseases were caused by spirits and that each disease had its own particular spiritual cause. People back then also wrote frequently about death and ghosts. They firmly believed that death was not the end for a man and that you had a spirit that survived well beyond death. This was something that you got from God who died during man's creation. So like a nice little bonus on top of this suck ass mortal life we're all expected to live through. As for our oldest depiction of a ghost, that dates back 3,500 years to a Babylonian tablet that seems to show somebody leading a ghost back into the afterlife. So they were telling ghost stories not entirely dissimilar from campfire ones and movies you see on Netflix all those thousands of years ago. The ghost in this tablet, for anyone curious, was being led back to the afterlife by a companion, and that's why the spirit was restless in the first place. It was just lonely. Now, this is a common theme in ghost stories, even to this day, that a ghost will return to this mortal plane because something is causing it to be reckless, some unfinished business it has to deal with. If you can solve that problem for the ghost, then it can return to the afterlife and rest. And ghost stories have appeared in all cultures throughout all times around the world, and while the details of these change from place to place, the general theme of the spirit of the dead remains quite constant. So how does science account for so many ghost stories and sightings? Well, the first and most obvious is some of them are hoaxes. So let's start with one of the most famous hoax stories. In 1848, Maggie and Kate Fox, who were 14 and 11 at the time, tricked their mother and a neighbour into thinking that a ghost was banging on the walls of their home. And they were able to do this and fake that sound by simply cracking their knuckles or toes, something they continued to do for 40 straight years. So that's fair. Yeah, so... After the prank, the neighbours told others what had happened, word spread, and then others became interested. And even after the Fox family left the home, locals investigated after a rumour that a travelling salesman had died in that house. They searched it and found what they thought were bones and hair in the basement. The girls, on the other hand, were invited elsewhere to see if they could also communicate with the dead, and they managed to perform their feat in front of a massive crowd of 400, and no one could find evidence of a hoax. The sisters continued to perform these seances well into adulthood, and are generally credited with starting the spiritualism movement in the United States. Everything they did was entirely based on fraud, and it was just them going... 
And speaking of movies, and moving a little into the future, we now have the Amityville Horror, which was a hoax made up in the 1970s to basically just help a guy get off on a murder charge. So the story here is in 1974, a guy called Ronald DeFeo Jr. killed his parents and four of his siblings. His insanity defense was predicated on voices having told him to do the murders. At some points, he claimed it was a demon, at other times that it was a mob hit, or that his sisters did it. He laughed off stories about anything supernatural, and then would change to say that, no, totally, a demon told me to do it, just based on how he seemingly felt that day. He changed stories like, some people change socks. After the murders, the Lutz family bought that house, and that was what the Amateurville horror was based on. That family then claimed that the house was haunted, citing all manner of spiritual and paranormal phenomena. And the resulting book based on their story, and the film that got made from that book, is what made the house infamous, and they are still making Amityville horror movies to this day. But in Amityville itself though, pretty much everybody knows that the story was a hoax made up to help a guy get away with murder and, you know, later to sell some books. DeFeo's own lawyer, William Weber, later admitted to making the whole story up over a few bottles of wine. He worked with the Lutz family to make this story up to sell some books. He admitted as much in an interview with People magazine in 1979. And they're still making movies about this to this day. So these are just two different hoaxes, but the pretty substantial ones because one started basically the entire pseudo-religious movement around spiritualism with the idea of people communicating with the dead and the other has remained one of the most famous and enduring ghost stories of the modern era which just goes to show that people are more willing to believe in these stories even after they are outright admitted to be hoaxes. We've got to move on and talk about potentially another explanation and that is sleep paralysis which if anyone out there has experienced it sucks. It happened to me once, most terrifying moment of my life. And that's not the time I saw a ghost. That was just the time I nearly pissed myself at 30 years old. So sleep paralysis is becoming a more and more well-known phenomenon these days. There are even horror movies based upon it that take a few liberties with the exact science of how it functions. So people with sleep paralysis can wake up and be totally unable to move. Hence the name sleep paralysis. They can't speak, they can't scream, but they can feel, they can see. They can hear, they can sense, and they may even feel a weight on their chest. Yes, you can. You may even see something sitting there. Perhaps a ghost, or a demon, or some other spooky monster in the corner of your room. Just ever so slightly out of the corner of your peripheral of your vision. How terrifying would that be? Spoilers, very terrifying. Now about one in five people can experience some kind of sleep paralysis and the way it happens is that your body transitions between REM sleep and wakefulness. In REM sleep you have vivid, very realistic dreams, but to stop you from acting them out, you know, just swinging your arms around and slapping your spouse in the face, your brain paralyzes your body. Sleep paralysis occurs when this transition gets messed up somehow. Essentially, you are awake, but still in this dreamlike state that makes nightmares come to life. So, some sleep paralysis hallucinations are fully multi-sensory. You see, you hear, you even feel as though they are real. You may not really have any way to tell that these things aren't real until you actually properly wake up. And that might be where a good deal of ghost sightings come from. A state where everything seems real, but in reality it's your mind creating these things. It's just a dream that seems very real, very scary, and it sucks. I would not wish it upon anybody. But, you know, another explanation that we could talk about is toxic mould. So, another theory about what causes hauntings and all manner of spooky goings on is that the older a house is, the more likely it is to contain a spirit. But do you know what else an old house is more likely to contain? Black mould. And this kind of toxic mould has been linked to people experiencing paranormal phenomena. Because it's known that some kinds of mould and fungus that happen to appear a lot in older houses can cause serious psychological problems, including hallucinations. In an old building with a mould problem and poor circulation, a person could be breathing in those toxic spores and suffering these psychological effects as a result and never really know it. This isn't to say that if you have a mould problem, your house is definitely going to be big haunted, or at least you're going to think that it is. It just means that you might be more inclined to hear a creak, a thump, to how settling and become anxious and paranoid, because that's what the mold is doing to you. And that you might that anxiousness and paranoia might result in you thinking that there's a thing looming in the darkness. If you see a shadow move the wrong way, you might be glad to believe it's paranormal rather than a perfectly natural thing of just, you know, a shadow. 
Anyway, now let's talk about infrasounds. This is a really interesting one and something I learned about years ago and it terrified the hell out of me. So, like mold, infrasound is another one of those insidious, hidden things that might be playing tricks on your mind and you just don't know about it. Infrasound is a sort of blanket term for any sound that is below the frequency human beings can normally hear at. And in experiments, people subject it to infrasound, which remember, they can't actually perceive, they, it just happens to them, it can cause them to experience a range of quite negative emotions. These include anxiety, fear, revulsion, and even extreme sorrow that they can't explain the reasoning of. It can also give you the chills, and because the sound is so low frequency, you don't even know that you're hearing it. You just feel its effects. But as an example of the kind of things that infrasound could do to you, in the 1980s, an engineer named Vic Tandy was working in a lab, and his co-workers began to suspect that the whole thing was haunted. Vic Tandy didn't really believe these until one night he was working alone and suddenly got the feeling he was being watched. That's the paranoia. He broke out in a cold sweat and the hairs on the back of his neck stood up, and then from the corner of his eye he saw it, a shape moving towards him. Then he turned around and nothing was there. This is the stuff horror movies are made of. The next day, by chance, he discovered that a newly installed fan in the lab was producing extremely low, but ironically loud... Can you describe a sound you can't hear as loud? I guess you can that produced waves at around 19 hertz. The same frequency would later be found in the haunted basement of a pub where people claim to have seen the ghost of a grey lady. And in fact, many haunted locations around the world just ex naturally experience just this sound. Like, you find this sound in the basements of old buildings that people say are haunted. You can probably do the math here. So, if anyone wondering how it works, the resonant frequency of a human body is about 19 hertz, and when you're ex experiencing infrasound at roughly that frequency, it can cause your chest to vibrate, giving you the feeling of breathing difficulties. That's where the shortness of breath comes in. It can also lead to cold sweats and a panicked feeling, because, you know, your breath's being taken away for a reason that you can't quite explain or fathom. It can also vibrate your eyes, which causes visual distortions, which might explain the weird grey shapes on your peripheral, which, thanks to pareidolia, you know, spotting patterns in randomness, you might just assume is a person or other spooky phenomenon coming to get you because your brain doesn't like seeing random things. It likes to have an explanation for them so you can understand them, even if the thing is naturally not something you're supposed to be able to understand because it's random. The brain's weird. Of course, mold, infrasound and hoaxes and sleep paralysis demons probably don't count for all instances of hauntings and ghosts that people have reported, but they do account for some. And if those scientific explanations for a few of these things, there are probably scientific explanations for at least a few more. Does this mean that ghosts don't exist at all? No, but it does mean that not every ghostly sighting or encounter is real. There might be an explanation. So thank you to everyone for watching at home. I hope you enjoyed this new format where we task a member of our writing team with answering a question from you, our lovely audience. If you happen to have a question or something you'd like one of our writers to answer in this style, do let us know in the comments section below and we'll certainly get them on it. I'm fingers crossed for one on aliens. I'm big all in on aliens, let's go. But hey, you know, share your spooky stories in the comments section below and thank you for watching. Leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you all next time. Cheers.